Well, uh, hello again. Uh, welcome to uh, another uh, class uh, on our uh, main theme, The Kingdom of God is Like. This is lesson number two. And uh, the title of this lesson is Living in the Kingdom, Living in the Kingdom. So last time uh, we were together in our previous uh, lesson, we reviewed the, the history, the prophecy and the fulfillment of God's promise to establish his kingdom here on earth. And that was lesson number one that was titled, my kingdom is not of this world. And uh, I think we emphasized the idea there uh, that uh, the kingdom um, is, you know, the authority for the kingdom, the ruler of the kingdom is otherworldly. However, this otherworldly kingdom exists in this world. And we talked about how to enter into it, uh, how it uh, was first established and so on and so forth. This time we're gonna talk about actually living in the spiritual kingdom uh, while here in this physical, um, physical world. So we looked at the uh, various ways that the kingdom was described and uh, some of its unique uh, features. And I finished up uh, last time by listing uh, the eventual outcome of the kingdom when uh, Jesus uh, returns. Uh, it's no surprise then uh, to know that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of Christ was a major topic in Jesus's teaching. I mean, it was the essence of his uh, teaching. He came to uh, establish his kingdom here on earth and do everything necessary in order to uh, establish it. So it's no surprise, as I say, uh, that it was a major uh, tenet in uh, Jesus's uh, teaching to the people. Uh, we see an example of this emphasis in, on the kingdom in Matthew chapters uh, five, six, and seven where the Lord's sermon deals primarily with how one is to live and conduct himself as a member of this, uh, of this uh, kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount uh, could be entitled uh, a Sermon on How to Live in the Kingdom of God. Uh, and that's what we're gonna look at today. So let's read uh, Matthew chapter five, verse one and two to begin our study of this section of Matthew and what it teaches us about life in the kingdom. So Matthew chapter five, verse one and two uh, says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened uh, his mouth and began teaching them saying. And so uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a, um, a collection, if you will, of topics that Jesus addressed at this occasion and partially mentioned uh, by other uh, gospel writers. Uh, Luke uh, in chapter six, verse 17 talks about uh, some of the same things that are uh, in Matthew. Uh, the setting is a hillside uh, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I've been to that particular uh, place when I traveled to uh, Israel several years back and there's a chapel there at, at the moment, at the time, of course, there wasn't one, but at the moment there's a chapel there and uh, you can see the hillside where uh, this took place. Very unique because it, uh, that uh, topography, if you wish, doesn't exist in other parts of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of the lake, if you will. Uh, this uh, particular place uh, was near the town of Capernaum where both Jesus and Peter uh, lived as adults. So it'd be natural that he would, you know, preach uh, near his home and uh, for a group of people, too many people maybe to fit into a, uh, fit into a synagogue. Uh, Matthew says that after Jesus finished this sermon or this teaching, he came down and after healing several people from the crowd, he went into Peter's home and even healed Peter's mother-in-law who was suffering from a uh, a high uh, fever and it says in Matthew chapter eight verses 14 uh, to 17 that uh, he merely touched her and she, she immediately arose up and began uh, serving uh, the apostles and Jesus and the guests uh, in her home. 
Now, the Sermon uh, on the Mount deals with five major subjects. We're not going to do a line by line thing. I just want to show you um, examples of what life in the kingdom is supposed to be like. And these uh, ideas are spread over five uh, main subjects. And the five are the Beatitudes, uh, chapter five, one to 16, the law, Jesus speaks about the law, uh, Mosaic law, chapter 5, 17 to 48, uh, the relationship that a person in the kingdom has with God. What is the relationship like for a person who is in the kingdom? What's his or her relationship with God like? In chapter six, verses one to 34, the fourth area is relationship with other people. The people in the kingdom of God who are here on earth, what is their relationship with the people who are here on earth, but who are not in the kingdom of God? And then uh, the, fifth, the fifth area of teaching, the way of life, chapter seven, verses uh, 13 to 29. How does one conduct himself? Uh, what is the lifestyle of the individual who is uh, part of the kingdom of God here on earth? So, in this uh, lesson, I'm going to comment on all five of these areas. Like I said, we don't, we don't have time to go over uh, the Sermon on the Mount uh, line by line, but we can uh, examine it uh, looking at these five areas that Jesus uh, you know, taught on and you know, what, he, what he said about these things. So let's look at the uh, Beatitudes uh, first. Uh, the word Beatitude uh, does not appear in the New Testament uh, as such. Uh, it is a Latin translation, a beatitudo, a Latin translation of the word blessed, which means happy or joyful or, or blessed, if you wish. There are uh, nine of these uh, and all of them begin in the same way. Uh, they, they make a promise, uh, they deal with spiritual things and they're directed for people at the king, in the kingdom. And you need to remember this idea uh, that uh, the Beatitudes and what is written here in the Sermon on the Mount is directed towards people who are in the kingdom, not people who are not within the kingdom. Uh, these things make no sense. You know, the, 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 uh, the teachings uh, about conduct and attitude and relationships, uh, the, these teachings in the Sermon of, uh, on the Mount, uh, don't make sense to people who are not Christians. I mean, they understand maybe what it's being taught, but it makes no sense to them in, in context because they're not members of the kingdom, all right? Um, the uh, style uh, that uh, Jesus uses in the Beatitudes, um, uh, it was actually a style that the rabbis uh, had in introducing their lesson, uh, and they'd introduced their lesson with a question or, or a paradox. And so the Beatitudes were contradictions which challenged the preconceived notions of life and philosophy that existed at that time. For example, that the spiritually poor would obtain the riches in heaven, uh, or that mourners uh, would be comforted or that the gentle uh, will gain the earth, uh, meaning you know, not the warriors, it's not the warriors that gain the earth, it's the, the, the ones with the gentle spirit, they're the ones that gain uh, the earth, uh, that the thirsty will truly be uh, satisfied. And so in the Beatitudes, Jesus gives insight into the spiritual reality that operates in the kingdom of heaven. These are spiritual principles in which we in the kingdom operate. All right, we need to remember that very important point. A lot of people take the Beatitudes and uh, you know, apply them to you know, politics or apply them to, to uh, other worldly activities by worldly people who have no uh, spiritual dimension and it doesn't work, all right? So those who bear persecution uh, in the name of Christ, for example, they do rejoice. Uh, and of course, that's not the normal reaction for those who are persecuted, right? 
Ordinarily in the world, someone who's persecuted usually reacts with fear or anger or a desire for revenge. That's the normal reaction uh, of an individual who is uh, persecuted uh, here in this world. They demand justice, all right? But in the kingdom, but in the kingdom, the spiritual laws work in such a way that those who suffer uh, for Christ do rejoice in their sufferings, all right? That's the difference. Uh, Jesus ex is explaining the mechanics of how things work in the kingdom. In the world, those who are persecuted react with fear and revenge or whatever, you know? but in the kingdom, those who are persecuted because of Christ's sake, uh, this persecution is the source of, of their joy. Uh, it doesn't mean that the persecution hurts less or has no effect on them, but it also has the power to produce joy in their spirit because the persecution is done uh, on account of their faith in Christ. Disciples in the kingdom influenced by these principles are distinctive, like salt as a flavor or light uh, to the eye is uh, uh, distinctive, right? And so, so the person who is in the kingdom, who is responding like people in the kingdom are supposed to respond, um, shed light in this world. Imagine a person who's persecuted, who's hounded you know, unfairly in this world and responds with gentleness, uh, responds with meekness, responds with kindness. People are taken aback by that. Wait a minute, that's not normal. What's, what, what's with this person? Why are they so different? Well, the answer, of course, they're different because they live in the kingdom and they operate under uh, the principles uh, of the kingdom. And so the distinctiveness of the disciples characterized by the principles set forth in the Beatitudes, this is what makes them stand apart from others and what categorizes the kingdom like the saltiness of salt or the, or the, or the brightness of light, okay? So this distinctiveness ultimately perceived in good lives and good works, not only characterizes the kingdom, but it also reveals the true nature of God to fallen man. I mean, in the, in the Beatitudes, we see man as he is in the regenerated state, not as he was in the state of lostness without Christ. You know, an individual is born again in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so the standards that we see in the Beatitude are the standards for those who have been born again, for those who are regenerated, not for those who are lost and who are uh, in the world and who are in, in, in darkness. And I, I mentioned this first because it's, it's very important that we understand uh, this idea because so many times people try to apply the terms or the laws or the principles of, of, of the kingdom and they try to apply them directly to people who are not regenerated, who are not, don't have the spirit of God within them and it doesn't work uh, that way, okay? Um, the, he next, the, he talks about uh, the, uh, the law uh, in verse 20, for example, Matthew 5:20. He says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so the key verse here in the discourse is in this verse 20. And it reveals that the higher righteousness of the disciples, this is the quality that distinguishes them and makes them useful in the kingdom. That's the idea of the salt that's lost its saltiness. So someone who is regenerated, who's part of the kingdom, but does not live according to the principles of the kingdom has no impact on the world, can have no impact on the world. Why? Because they act and, and think like people in the world. And so, you know, you, you're, you're not presenting anything new or different to the world when you, when you act contrary, uh, when you as a Christian act contrary to what uh, Jesus is teaching uh, in, this, um, in this passage. Uh, the section from um, uh, Matthew 5, verse 17, all the way to verse 48, uh, in, in this section, Jesus makes a series of comparisons, 
putting forth what they had been taught about the law by their teachers. In other words, when he says, you have heard that it has been said, okay? That, that's what they have been taught by their teachers. And then he lays beside these teachings, the essence or the spirit of what the law given by the one who, uh, uh, who, who, who gave the uh, law originally to Moses, uh, uh, which is Jesus himself, uh, what they think. In other words, uh, he compares what they understand the law to mean. He compares that to what the law actually means, explained by the one who actually gave the law. And so Jesus comments on five areas of teaching in the law of Moses that they had received from their teachers. And he compares it with the true essence of what that teaching actually means according to the one who gave the law. So for example, uh, murder, that's an area of the law, murder. In verses uh, 21 and uh, 22, let's read that. He says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So Jesus, you know, he, he, he pegs the crime at the beginning of anger and resentment towards others. And that keeping the law meant a conscious effort at reconciliation and not just avoiding murder, which would be the extreme. The, the law forbade the extreme, you know, thou shalt not murder over here. It, it put the peg, if you wish, the flag at murder. Uh, Jesus said, you think you know the law? Uh, just because you don't murder someone, you think this is, the, this is the demand of the law? Let me explain to you what the true demand of the law is. And he goes ahead, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the bottom of this passage here, second part of the passage here, he says, you know, I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty. You see what I'm saying? He says, you think you know what the law teaches about murder, that you shouldn't murder? Uh, I'm telling you that you're guilty when you start having uh, anger against your brother, when you, uh, when you insult your brother, okay? So it's, it's like a continuum. And on this continuum, it begins with an angry heart or resentment or, you know, harsh words, you know, uh, which leads to anger and violence and, and, and it ends up at murder. And Jesus says, you're guilty of this commandment, not if you happen to go right to the very end, murder, but when you begin, uh, when your heart refuses to forgive, when you uh, nurture resentment in your heart, you've already broken that, that commandment. He then talks about adultery in verses uh, 27 and 28. And he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see the trend here? You know, these Jews, many of them, had been taught to manipulate the law in order to justify their adultery. And they did this with easy divorce. And so in their thinking, you know, they thought, well, as long as I give my wife a bill of divorce, I've not sinned when I've divorced her, you know? Why? Because I've fulfilled the, techni uh, the technicalities of the law. The law says, you know, you, you, you have to give a, a bill of divorcement uh, in order to uh, put her uh, away. And, and, and many were thinking, well, you know, I see someone that I like better. Well, I'm just going to write, you know, a bill of divorcement. I've done my duty to the law. I just go ahead and do what I want to do. Okay. Jesus again situates the true sin as impurity of the heart and the keeping of the law as an effort to control one's body, not, not, not to manipulate the law. He, he's, he's explaining where the true sin is and what keeping the law here really meant. Keeping the law here really meant 
maintaining a pure heart. That's what, the, not, not just getting a divorce and not providing a bill of divorcement. Uh, that again, that, that was at the end. That's when everything you know, falls apart. Jesus pegs the obeying of the law at the very beginning on that continuum, which is having a pure, having a pure heart. He talks about the area of vows in verse 33 and 34. He says, again, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of, uh, it is the throne of God. So they had learned, the Jews at the time, they had learned a complex manner of making selective vows, which they felt they could break when it was convenient. And Jesus reveals that vows are not necessary when one has an honest heart. The law requires an honest heart. If you don't have an honest heart, you will eventually, you know, your, your word is no good. You can, you can sign a contract, you can have all kinds of pieces of legal paper you know, to bind you to a certain uh, a commitment, but if your heart is not honest, you'll find a way around that. And that's what Jesus is pointing to. He's saying to them over and over again, you think you know the law? You, know, you have heard that it was said. You think you know the law? Let, let me show you what the law really demands of an individual. He talks about uh, justice in verse 38 and 39. It says here, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other him, to him uh, also. Uh, well, their system at the time relied on the law as a tool for restitution and many times a cover for revenge. Uh, Jesus taught them that the higher principle of the law was mercy uh, and not simply exact, uh, exacting justice or, or revenge. Actually, originally the law wasn't meant, to, the law was given uh, on, on justice here uh, or to mitigate evil so that people would not go too far. Uh, someone stole a sheep you would come back and take possession of their entire herd. You know what I'm saying? It was an effort to fit the, the punishment to the crime. Uh, but with time, this here was used as a cover for revenge. You know, I'm just doing what the law says, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, okay? And so uh, Jesus taught them that, again, the higher principle of the law was mercy and uh, compassion. Uh, if a person has mercy and compassion, those are higher qualities than simple uh, justice. And then he talks about uh, nationalism in verses 43 and 44. Um, let's just read that. He says, you have heard, always starts the same way. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You see, they would use the law to build a kind of a wall around themselves and keep others out as a way of isolating themselves. Jesus showed them that one purpose of the law was to reveal God's goodness to men, that to be like God meant to have justice and especially mercy towards the strangers and towards those who were uh, dis, uh, dispossessed. Uh, they were using the law uh, as, a, as a cover to not be involved with anyone else, not to let anyone else in, not to be bothered by uh, other uh, people, uh, to be isolated from others. Uh, Jesus teaches them once again, this is the, these are the demands of the law that they were not uh, aware of. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, um, he also teaches them how to have a proper relationship with God in heaven, all right? And so, uh, again, won't read all the passages, don't have time, but in chapter six, verses one to 34, uh, is the teaching or our teachings about how to have a relationship with God. Well, first he talks about practicing goodness towards God with a view of pleasing God rather than pleasing man. 
So if you want to have a relationship with God, your priority has to be, I want to do what pleases God, not I want to do what pleases other people. Secondly, pray to God in order to communicate with him and not simply to impress others with your piety. You know, when he's saying uh, people pray uh, out loud or in public in order to receive attention to themselves, that they're pious people, that they're good, that they're holy, uh, you know, and spiritually minded, you know, but this was, all, this was all a show. The idea is that if you want a relationship with God, you need to pray to him. You need to develop a relationship with him through, uh, through prayer. And then of course he mentions a trust. You have to have trust in God to provide for all of your physical and spiritual needs. You know, one day at a time, we live one day at a time. I, I have, I've mentioned this to others before, but I have like a to-do list. Don't we all have a to-do list? Some have it on their phones or computers. I still do the old fashioned way. I write it down. I have a pad. And, and, and at the top of the pad, uh, I rewrite every time I, I do a new list, I write, I'll trust the Lord for that. As a reminder to myself, uh, when I get up in the morning, and if I haven't figured out how to do and how to resolve all the issues that are before me, uh, I've learned the hard way that I have to trust God for that. I might know, uh, you know how to fix item one or two on the list, but item three, four, and five, you know, I still haven't figured out how to do that. Uh, will I have enough money to do that? Or you know, will I have the resources to complete that? And that, that little line is a reminder to myself that I have to trust the Lord with that every single day. That's how you live from one day at a time. As a matter of fact, it's, it's a primary lesson that the Christian uh, living in the kingdom has to learn. They have to learn they must trust God for these things one day at a time. And so Jesus encourages his audience in understanding the nature of the kingdom through the Beatitudes and the quality of life that they should strive for as salt and light of the earth, and that is the essence of the law. And, how, uh, and now he guides them into practical ways of how to have a meaningful relationship with God. Practice goodness, pray to God, and trust in him. Now he moves on uh, to a relationship with other people in verse 12, and he says there, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Chapter seven, verse 12. So the elements of a proper relationship with God are followed by the key idea to a blessed relationship between people in the kingdom, right? You know, he talks about the law, yeah, how, how someone is to conduct themselves. He talks about relationship with God, you know, prayer and all that. Now he's going to talk about a relationship with other people in the kingdom. How do we relate to one another as members of the kingdom here on, on earth? Well, in verse 12, as I read, in everything therefore treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. So upon this principle is based all of the teaching in the law and the prophets on how we must treat one another in order to bless ourselves and to please, to please God. Next, he moves on to the way of life that we should have in the, in the kingdom, as I mentioned before. Having set forth the parameters of the kingdom, its inner workings, Jesus explains the way to enter into the relationship with the Father in the kingdom of heaven. How do you get in? How do you leave the world and enter into the, into the kingdom? And so first of all, he says, you have to enter by the narrow way, the narrow gate, who is Christ. Later on, at his crucifixion, the disciples will understand just how narrow and difficult this gate is. Uh, Jesus is the only gate that you can enter through and faith is the only way that you uh, are, are able to uh, enter in. This is why it's narrow. 
There's so many other gates, if you wish, so many other ways in the world that seem so much easier uh, 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 that entice us to live our lives in such a way because you know, the gate is wide, the way is easy, a lot of people on that way, you know, we, uh, the, these, all these people, they can't all be wrong. But Jesus specifically tells us that, that the, 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 the gate is narrow, meaning there are not five gods and there are not three saviors, there's just one savior, only one name under heaven by which we uh, can be saved. Uh, Acts chapter four, verse 12, that's, that's the narrow gate. It's narrow because there's only one person through whom we can enter uh, the uh, kingdom. And, and, and faith is the way that we enter in. And, and faith is difficult. The reason faith is difficult is because it's, counter, it's counterintuitive. You know, what's intuitive is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I work my way in, I do good and I, you know, I earn my way in because that's how it works in the world. But in the kingdom, it doesn't work like that. You enter in because of faith and not because of what you've done or who you are, how good you try to be and what your intentions are. Faith is the way to enter through uh, the uh, narrow uh, door. Uh, secondly, he, he says, beware of false prophets who produce neither the teachings nor the fruit of the kingdom of Christ. He tells them, this is how you know them, neither the fruit nor the teachings. The true prophets have the fruit plus the teachings. And so you have to judge Christianity or any other religion by its fruit. I teach another course on the comparative religion uh, comparative religions. And, and uh, in that course, I, uh, there's a section where I talk about uh, the supremacy of the Christian faith. Uh, and, and, and I compare it to other religions, the other major religions in the world, and demonstrate how Christianity is superior to all of these other faiths. It's superior in its concept of salvation. It's superior in the, the, uh, the amount of revelation. It's superior in the way it reveals God. It's superior in the result that an individual uh, can have uh, uh, while living a faithful, quote, Christian life. Uh, and I tell people, look around, look at the nations that have different religious, uh, historical religions in their country, uh, how's that country doing? Morally, economically, socially, you know? It's very easy, believe it or not, to, 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 to establish uh, the excellency and the supremacy of the Christian faith over every uh, religion. Hey, there's good in every religion, good ideas, good, you know, the teaching of good, but none of them uh, can uh, compare uh, with the excellency of not only the promises, uh, but the, uh, the, 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 the lifestyle uh, uh, of the Christian faith and what it can produce, uh, not only in heaven, but here, uh, here on earth. And then thirdly, he says, don't just hear, do. Don't just hear, do. Don't just hear the words of Christ, act upon them in order to uh, enter into the kingdom. You know, when he says many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. Uh, we are preaching the gospel to many people. Many people know about Jesus. Many people know about the church. Many people know about the Bible. Many people have read the Bible, but not everyone has entered in by the narrow gate, which is Jesus. And not many have entered the narrow gate through faith. It's not, an easy, it's not an easy thing. Don't just hear what Jesus is saying. You have to do what uh, Jesus is, uh, is saying. So many heard all of what he said that day in the Sermon on the Mount, and they were amazed at his teaching. But only a few entered through the narrow gate of the cross. Okay, so there's a little bit of information about um, how do we live uh, in the kingdom uh, of God? Uh, we're going to continue uh, with more uh, lessons on this, but I do have a, 
a bit of a homework for you, if you will, please. And that would be to uh, read chapters uh, eight and nine. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, uh, we'll tackle the next uh, uh, topic in our series of uh, the kingdom of God is like. That's it for now. Thank you very much for your attention and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.